I'm a feminist, but I once worked for a man so handsome, I secretly hoped everyone would think I'd slept my way into the job. <laughs> I had not. I am a feminist, but my pregnant sister has been sending updates about the baby, and the other day she sent one that said, today she is the same weight as a rock melon. And I thought, oh, that's my goal weight. <laughs> First thought. I'm a feminist, but my very favourite episode of Mad Men is season six, episode nine, in which Don Draper leaves his neighbour and lover, Sylvia, in a hotel room and comes and goes at his leisure while giving her dominant instructions while he's away. My favourite scene is when he tells her to get his shoes and makes her get on her knees and put them on for him. I want him to make me do that. <laughs> I do not understand why. I just like the way he looks at her when he tells her to do it. <laughs> I would travel to his house to put his shoes on and leave if he told me to. Please do not email me and ask me to do this for you unless you're John Hamm and then do. My email is waitingforham to email at gmail.com. Is that a real email? Uh, it will be. It should be now. Up tonight, just in yeah. case, because, because this podcast is quite popular now, and easily a comedian who knows him, and he's got a really good sense of humour, because someone goes, oh, it's so funny, they're always talking about you, and then he might go, just for a laugh, I'll see if this email is real, so I'd better make sure it is, because what if he did and it wasn't and it bounced? Can you imagine if he emailed me and it bounced? Yeah, and then he was like, oh, it's not real, she's just teasing yeah. me. And, and he's <laughs> it. Um, I am a feminist, but my new favourite thing to say is, babe, I don't want to slut shame you, but you're a slut and you should be ashamed. <laughs> it's really fun to say. <laughs> I don't mean it. No. I just have a lot of slutty friends. <laughs> I'm a feminist, but a friend of mine is coming from Melbourne to guest on The Guilty Feminist in Sydney this Saturday. And uh, she could technically get up and back in a day. And she emailed me to say she has two small children, so she should probably do that. She said, as it is... My husband's going to be a bit annoyed with me for kind of taking off on the weekend. So I wrote back and said, stay the night, let's have cocktails on the harbour. It's been the patriarchy's weekend for 10,000 years. <laughs> Hashtag reclaiming Saturday night from the patriarchy. P.S. Don't tell Richard I said that. <laughs> That's true though. If that were a man, do you think he'd go back so he could get up super early on Sunday morning, woken up by two small children jumping on his face. No. I am a feminist, but, this is true, uh, my girlfriend does all my washing. <laughs> and last night, this came up in conversation with some friends, and I said, yeah, but she likes it. No! <laughs> you are Don Draper. Yeah, and when I was saying it, I 100% believed it. Wow. <laughs> Would you tell me to put your shoes on? Yeah, sure. Because I would be very open to that. Yeah, they just... I mean, they're pretty comfy shoes. They just kind of slip right on, but... Uh, and yeah, I'm looking more for a brogue or a lace-up. A sort of really... It's a different kind of dyke. <laughs> Good to know. Live from Giant Dwarf in Sydney, the Spontaneity Shop presents The Guilty Feminist with Deborah Francis White co-host Zoe coombs -Ma. a very special guest Tiffany Stevenson talking about what's the deal with men. This is The Guilty Feminist, the podcast in which we explore our noble goals as 21st century feminists and the hypocrisies and insecurities which undermine them. So today we're talking about what's the deal with men because it has been quite a week hasn't it? We've had Trump threatening North Korea, Kim Jong-un saying that nuclear wars just seconds away uh we've had weinstein and then the knock-on effect of weinstein which is every single woman on the internet saying yeah that's happened to me and then men going god that man is terrible <laughs> he has viciously 
a sexually harassed slash sexually assaulted every woman in the world. <laughs> and then we've had to and explain... thank God we caught him. <laughs> <laughs> we were wondering who was doing that. <laughs> we all got together, we couldn't work it out. We did a show of hands, who's doing it? Nobody Harvey did up. not put his hand up, so Denied he's a liar it. as well. He's out of the club, don't worry, sorted it out, it's yeah. good. So they've thrown Harvey very much to the wolves as a sacrificial <laughs> pig, basically. <Yeah. laughs> Zoe, what do you think the deal with men is? I don't know! I can't even tell them apart. <laughs> I can't, I can't, for real. I have like face blindness, but oh. just for men. It's that like, it's a real face blindness thing. It's like, um, it's called, what is it? Uh, not caring. <laughs> <laughs> I can't, I watched that. This is for real. So I was with my girlfriend, my wonderful girlfriend who does all my washing. Thanks, babe. Uh, I saw that movie Birdman, which I know came out a while ago, but watching Birdman, this is an example of how I really can't tell men apart. Watching Birdman, the whole way through, you know, it's got like Michael Keaton in it. That's the point because he's Batman, et cetera, et cetera. I was watching the whole movie thinking like, who is this guy? Do you know what would be really good? Is if this was Michael Keaton. Because <laughs> he was Batman. Is it Michael Keaton? I don't know. No idea. And then at the end, when the credits came up, it said Michael Keaton, and I went, oh. <laughs> wow. And, and Kate turned to me and so, went, you didn't know that was Michael Keaton, did you? And um, I said, no, I didn't. No. Oh, that's interesting. So you're going to learn tonight what the deal with men is. Yeah. By the end of the evening, you'll be able to tell the difference between sort of a Patrick Swayze and a Patrick Bellady or a... Patrick White. <laughs> Who's that? <laughs> Just made that up. It's an, it's an obscure reference. Uh, he's an Australian writer. Oh, okay. Um, might be dead, is he dead? The difference between... The difference between... So I won't run into him. I don't need to know what he looks like, do I? Because he's dead. Yeah. He's dead, and that's... Well, when he's done you a favour and taken himself out of the list of <laughs> men's spaces to remember. So Zoe did a big challenge. She's had a whole kind of mini career, really, playing a man, mm. playing Dave. Have you guys all seen Dave? And you won the Barry. Thanks, you won the Barry playing Dave. I did win the Barry. And no Barry, one knows what that is. You won a man's name for the... Uh, <laughs> I, I a biggest... woman, played a man, won an award named after a man who plays a woman. Barry Humphreys, yes. So it's the Melbourne Comedy Festival big prize. So it's like the Edinburgh Comedy Festival. It's very big, guys. It is, though. <laughs> it's very In important. comedy, it is. In comedy, it's very big. There's what we used to call the Perrier, and then now we call the Edinburgh Comedy Award. Yeah, and didn't then win that the one. Barry. Got nommed. They're the two biggies, and you got nommed for one and you won the other, which isn't bad. How did you develop... How did you develop, Dave? Dave kind of like organically came out of my own observations and frustrations of being a stand-up and watching those guys. Because I started doing stand-up when I was quite young. I was, you know, 15 when I first did it. And that was at like school variety nights and stuff. And then I was doing it in pubs and things from when I was about 18. And I just would see in all these open mic nights, it's what to be just seemed like the same guy getting up and doing... <laughs> <laughs> Because of the face blindness. Yeah. <laughs> I can't tell you apart. I just have to meet you 12 to 15 times. Uh, <laughs> my face blindness is not good in my career because it's like all my colleagues. Anyway, so it was just sort of seeing this same guy get up and do this same sort of thing. And as a comedian, because I love the audience, I'm totally, you know, obsessed with the audience. And you start to really get the audience's rhythms and you start to get really used to the way that the audience responds on this really kind of subliminal level when different people get on stage. So as a woman, there's a particular sort of thing that happens when you get on stage. An audience who doesn't know you kind of go like, even if they're like a nice audience, they're a little bit worried. Mm. They're just like... That's true, uh, yeah. And sometimes it's very blatant. Sometimes a lot of people get up and go to the toilet. Oh, you um, can see them in the front row saying... Yeah. Oh, it's a woman one, I don't find women funny. You know. Yeah, so that's a really sort of frustrating thing to have to deal with. And so at the same time, seeing these kind of guys, and some of them were great, but some of them were like <laughs> severely mediocre, getting up and just going like, <laughs> hello, everyone, uh, what's the deal with water bottles? <laughs> it comes out of the tap, what do we need a bottle for? <laughs> and everyone would be like, yes, this guy is so relatable. And... <laughs> I just became really quite jealous of that and I decided to just sort of do that. <laughs> uh, 
And so I started gluing hair onto my neck <laughs> and like binding my breasts down and just getting up and doing that thing. And it was just more fun. It was just like, what if I just do what that guy's doing? That's, and it was fun because as soon as I would go on stage, it would be like this totally different environment. It's like the audience would respond with more respect to a fake man than a real woman. <laughs> Like, so that was kind of interesting. And it was also the, like the last gig that I did as myself, and I was already doing Dave at this point, but the last gig that I did as myself was um, I was the only woman on a bill. It was an all male lineup except for me, and I was being myself, and I got up. Taxi. Uh, I got up on stage, and you're not even going to be able to hear the bottle in the um, <laughs> podcast. You're just going to be going, why does she keep saying taxi? <laughs> She's if trying to get out of here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, if you are listening at home, whenever Zoe Kuzma says taxi, someone's just kicked over a bottle in the audience, yeah. just to be clear. So, yeah, but the last gig I did was I had begged for ages to get this gig and I was, you know, ready to go on and the guy went up before me and started bombing and he turned on the audience, which happens sometimes. But the way that he did it was just to go, let's talk about rape. And then he just went into this intense, horrible, like, series of rape jokes. And the whole audience was just traumatised. And then it was like, next up, Zoe Coombs Ma! Oh, and worst. I had to go on stage and I was just like, I can't do this anymore. This is horrible. And so that's where a lot of the Dave stuff, like the sexism of Dave, and the because sometimes a male stand-up will kind of destroy your whole platform before you get up. Like, if they spend a whole lot of time going, bloody women, what are they on about? They're crazy. Whoa! Next up, a woman to talk about what she thinks. Yeah. So she's I, crazy. Yeah, she's yeah. crazy. And you're like, oh, respect me. <laughs> Please put your hands together and make enormous woo-hooing noises for Zoe Cook's Ma. Hi, guys. What's up, cunts? <laughs> Cervixes. Cervixes. That's the answer to that. That's what's up there. You're a great crowd. <laughs> Thanks for coming out tonight. If you have, you know. <laughs> do it when you feel safe. Make sure you've got a good support network around you. You guys are actually an amazing crowd. You're very smiley, aren't you? What's your name? Kate. Kate, what's your name? Yeah, also you. <laughs> Kate and... Liam. Yeah, Liam, just a bit of crowd work. Uh, <laughs> I'm very good. Uh, <laughs> Liam, I like it. Kate, hi. I'll see if I can work that into a... Um, do a bit of a callback for you later. But <laughs> I'm currently transitioning from performing as a man. I find myself performing half as myself and half as this strange guy. So if I do anything like that, like, you, fellas know what I'm talking about. If I do that, that's not me. That's just me being possessed. I've also found that I've started doing things like at the end of a joke, I'll just go, um, to cover if you don't laugh. <laughs> So, um, straight people are fascinating. I'm a lesbian, obviously. <laughs> what? <laughs> Sorry, ladies. <laughs> Bit of a slow burn, that one. That's what she said. <laughs> Doesn't make any sense. That wasn't me. Uh, so, uh, I'm a lesbian. Um, I find straight people fascinating. I love, um, you're crazy, you're wild, you're wild. Uh, I love, there's a lot in my neighbourhood, they're moving in all the time, <laughs> ruining the area, <laughs> making it really boring. Uh, no, it's fine, I love you guys, you're fine. My parents are both straight people, um, sort of. I love straight people. I love watching couples, I find it really fascinating watching couples. Uh, my favourite kind of straight couple to watch is the really fancy active wear couple. Like, you know, the... And it looks like she's... They've worked really hard to get as physically opposite to each other as possible. Like, she's really minuscule and he's a fucking mountain. Like, like it's like they've had a really good time at a carnival and then just went like, oh, let's turn into a funhouse mirror. Whee! Like, I saw this couple today and I was watching them and she looked like she only had about enough energy to say, it's a cavoodle. <laughs> it's a cavoodle. Her name's Lululemon. It's really embarrassing because for ages we were calling her Lululemon. <laughs> Which I was doing that. That was me. I thought it was Lululemon. Uh, 
But she's tiny, this tiny little waif, and he's just huge, like he's big with the side boob cut out, like the huge, muscly, like he's all tanned and oiled up like a brioche. <laughs> How much do those guys look like brioche? <laughs> Exactly like a fucking brioche. And it's ridiculous because every time she looks at him, she must be like, mmm, <laughs> brioche. <laughs> and you know she can't eat carbs. <laughs> oh, it's cruel. Stop torturing yourself, Rochelle. <laughs> that voice, by the way, the, it's a cavoodle, the straight girl voice, the, it's Lulu Lamont. Uh, <laughs> Enjoy that while it lasts, because I reckon that's going to be really bad soon. We'll work out that that's actually quite offensive. Uh, <laughs> guys, stop it. Don't. Don't. Because no one has it as hard as straight women. No one. You could not pay me enough. You've got all the same problems as normal women. So I flipped it. Uh, <laughs> but with the men thrown in. And like I say, I can't even tell you apart. No, I, to be honest, like, like seriously, I, I know you're all individuals. Right, Liam? Hey! This is your callback right there. For those at home, I pointed it at a different guy. It was very funny. So, uh, my mum's bi. My mum's bi. When I said my, both my parents are straight people, that's not true. My mum's bi. Uh, she keeps... This is new information that's come out quite recently. She just keeps telling me. Only me. She likes to tell me, I'm bi, so I'm bi, after a couple of vibes. I'm actually, I'm bi. That's how she sounds as well. She does, I'm bi. She sounds a bit like the magpie from Blinky Bill. Uh, I'm bi, sorry. Blinky Bill, I'm bi. She's non-practising, but... Uh, I'm bi. It's like, no, you're not, Mum. You just went to uni. Uh, I oh, know you're kind. I fucked heaps of them. <laughs> I actually spoke to mum today because I was like, I better tell her that I'm outing her. So it was like, oh, 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 that is very funny. She's almost too supportive. And, and then she was like, oh, well, that's, you know, it's actually, that's, that's wonderful, you know, because I, I tell people all the time and no one ever reacts. <laughs> what anyone thinks I'll stop doing the voice but she said you know she's like it's really important especially as an older woman to really kind of represent that and that sort of by invisibility and of making sure that also she's in a position to stand up for other people who might not be able to say what their sexuality is and, and I was like fuck you mum you ruined my joke <laughs> at a nice moment um, but I'm really lucky with my parents um, I came out quite early I was about 16 and they were fantastic my mum obviously was ecstatic oh, boy! <laughs> she didn't say that at the time she said I will store that away <laughs> for when it is more appropriate and then I'll say it all the time <laughs> hi mum uh, yeah so but my dad actually had a really hard time with it at first like, it was quite good but he, he his problem with it, he was like, oh, I love you, Zoe, but, um, you know, I don't want to... I don't want to... He didn't want me to... He didn't want me to lock anything in. He thought I was too young. He was like, you know, you don't want to... I think he was still hoping for a phase. He was like, you don't want to... You know, you don't want to lock any... You know, don't put any labels on yourself. You don't want to... Um, you don't want to paint yourself into a corner. That's what he said. You don't want to paint... Don't paint yourself into a corner. It really upset me. I had to say to him, you know, Dad... I just told you I'm a lesbian. As if I would fuck up a home improvement project. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that's all my time. Thanks, guys. So my challenge, Zoe, because you've done that extraordinary challenge. And I did it specifically awards. for this podcast. It was all leading up to this moment. My challenge is for you to, and the audience, to coach me to find a man, to find a, a ma not find a man, sorry, that's not <laughs> To find a man inside of me, that also sounds wrong. Uh, <laughs> to find a, to find my male, I suppose my, my, my male character. So could you teach me to be a man tonight on stage? And could I find a male character tonight on stage? That's the question. Let's try. Shall okay, we? let's do it. Um, <laughs> I feel like I... Should I have a chair? Should I have a chair? Yeah, you can have a chair. I mean, what are we doing? Do you want to do sort of physical stuff? I mean, there's a whole mental part of it. They're saying, if you're a man, you wouldn't be asking whether to stand or sit. And people are saying I should stand. So I'm going to stand. 
I've already failed. No, hold on, I should sit because fuck you. Oh God, I don't know. I've got a lean, I'm gonna do a lean. It's not, it's not convincing, is it? It's not convincing. Um, okay, so Amy, how would you like me to stand? Well, I think for the starters, just then when you're like, it's not convincing, it really needs to be more about your comfort. <laughs> Men don't go like, all right, I'm going to put my elbows out because that's what men look like. They're, it's sort of what, more about I just... I thought that's what they were doing. I'm doing yeah. they I'm like, a man, quit. I get to put my elbows out on public transport. Like a cowboy plane. It's more about, it's just your comfort and also stripping away any consciousness of what you look like oh. from the outside. So yeah. doing things like this. <laughs> if, you're, if you're listening at home, Zoe is patting her stomach, which is she's protruding out, and she's got her mouth half open. It's quite comfy. Uh. But you don't... <laughs> I just look like Benny Hill. I look like Benny Hill. I'm not... <laughs> this is not... I'm going to have to turn my necklace off because I feel that's getting in the way of being... It just doesn't feel right now. The fun thing is the sort of confidence. Yeah. So you just, you're confident... Confident. Just but striding you, around, just being confident. So stop, like... Lunging. Remove any... <laughs> I could lunge, yeah, go on. And with the confidence, just, like, remove any need for backing that up. Any reason for the confidence? <laughs> just... <laughs> if you're listening at home, I've just jumped onto a bit of the stage, didn't know it was here previously, but now I see it. I see it, and I see it. it's my domain now. Didn't even know it was here. But now I own the curtains. <laughs> I, I might do some leaning. There's a lot of lean. I feel like, yeah, just take up space. That feels amazing. I see why they do it. I see why they do it. That feels fantastic. I'm definitely going to do this again. Do you know what? Normally I'd sort of go, oh, and I'd try and get off this bit of the stage, the raised bit to the flat bit. I'd try and sort of do it like that to just be delicate or think I couldn't do it. But now I could just do it without even looking. It's weird. I would recommend you try this. Okay, so I feel I've got the physical, Zoe. It's really good. I just jumped without... I just thought, yeah, I'll land. <laughs> There'll be a floor there. And there was, but there was. Men are right. You just jump, there's a floor there, and nothing happens. I've got precariously close to the end of the stage here. The people in the front row are worried about my confidence now. They feel I'm overly confident with the skills I've got. But I'm afraid, ladies, that's being a man. <laughs> You got it. What do I do now? Can you give me some voice? Well, just, just stop asking me what to do. Just do it. I think my man is posh. Because I think that the way that the posh men speak, they're not using their organs of articulation at all. There's no need for it. Just let your mouth fall open. And whatever sound falls out, that's the right one. <laughs> it's the one that people deserve to hear. So that's, that's the, my man's definitely posh. He's definitely posh. He's not bothered with the... Oh, 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 oh. How are you ladies doing this evening? Glad to see me, I expect. That's her. So does it make you feel that? Yeah. Like, yeah. It's like a little bit like a man who's just had a stroke. <laughs> oh, oh. Evening. <laughs> okay, have we got anything else for me? Any other code? This is great. I've like, got it. Just you're follow giving your me permission. Bliss, babe. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to give a lecture now on something I don't know anything about, but I feel I will know. <laughs> Once I start talking. So could I have a, have a topic to give a lecture on, please? Tortoises. Tortoises, thank you, thank you. Do you know, I'm glad you've said tortoises. I'm really glad you've said tortoises because I have a capacious knowledge forming. Forming, I'm feeling it. Yeah, yeah, I know more about tortoises than I thought I knew. <laughs> now that you've said it. Now the tortoise is, um, is, is unique because it's, uh, not many people know this, it's an arachnid. Um, <laughs> It's, uh, now you think, it's a bit like, you know, you think a tomato is a vegetable, no, no, it's a fruit. Uh, similarly, you think a tortoise is a reptile, no. No, on QI, on QI, wrong, an arachnid. And that's because it's got, uh, it's got, you think it has four legs, but actually has four extra little baby legs that you can't see because they're under the shell. And they peep out, they peep out, they peep out, but when you're not looking, and that's the thing about them. About them, I had, a, uh, I had a tortoise once called Harvey. <laughs> Terribly slow. Uh, and the reason that tortoises are slow, and people don't know this, people don't know that the reason that tortoises are slow is because 
the mass of their shell is greater than the weight of their underbody. So they're always, it's always like if you're carrying luggage around uh, an airport. And if you're carrying luggage, it's all very well if you're carrying luggage that weighs less than you, but if suddenly you had to carry something that weighed more than you, yes, it would be on wheels, of course, of course, of course. That's implied. I mean, keep up. Um, now, what nobody knows except me and I'm going to reveal to the world this evening, is their extraordinary ability to reproduce. Because a tortoise doesn't need to mate with another tortoise to reproduce. Tortoises are able to reproduce on their own. Now, people don't know this, and they put, of course they put the boy tortoise and the girl tortoise together in, and they think, oh yes, you know, and then the tortoise comes out, and they think, they think, no, they're wrong about that. What's happening is that under the shell, there's a little womb under the shell, And that's the little four legs that I told you about, okay? <laughs> Peeping out, that's why they're there. And what they do is they suck in the old uh, spermatozoa. I may have, to be honest with you, I haven't finished the research. It might actually take two talk. I don't know what I'm talking about. Somebody needs to give me a drink. Um, I'm, it turns out I'm an alcoholic. Um, I've just realised, I do, my, this male character, he does a lot of cocaine. Um, his name's Oscar, and uh, he does a lot of cocaine. And in the process of understanding the nature of my research, I've had to take quite a lot of barbiturates. So, ultimately what I'm telling you is that tortoises reproduce without any help. They are arachnids, and their shell weighs more than their body. Now, if you haven't learnt those things, that's not my fault. Because I've taught them to you, good and proper. Taxi. Very good. That was, yeah, that was a... Uh, that was a good experience. It started to get a bit high. I felt like I was a bit high in the end. And I realised that I was like, oh God, it's like an out-of-body experience that I'm sort of, I'm, am I still talking? <laughs> and, I started, and I thought, this is pure man now. Where I'm like, I'm still talking, I don't know where I'm going, but I'm still happy to be here. Do the men in the room feel, I imagine you feel a little bit like Bruno Jenkins in The Witches. <laughs> like, you know the little boy who accidentally is, locks himself in The Witches meeting? In the... Are you feeling that? Are you feeling get a bit... Listen, as regular male listeners know, we are very inclusive to men. We love men and we, we very rarely talk about men in this way. But when I listen to Two Dope Queens, which I do regularly, do you know this podcast? Um, the hosts are African-American and I learn so much by listening to it. And often they will kind of go, you know what white people are like? And I'm like, oh, they're talking about, oh, that my people who are a problem. And sometimes the things that they say, it does make me uncomfortable, but... I do learn from it as well. I do realise how white people come across. And sometimes I think I personally wouldn't do that, but I'm more aware that if other white people are doing that, step in. And sometimes I think, well, there was one where they were going, they'd got on a train after the Women's March, and there was a disabled seat, and a white woman got on and sat in it, and they were all like, you can't sit there, because that's for disabled people. And the woman was like, oh, well, you know, no one's sitting here. And they told her to go. And then a white man came on, and he sat there, and they said, you can't say this for disabled people. And he said, well, I'll move if a disabled person comes. And they were all, like, going, oh, you know what white people are like? You know what white people are like? So entitled. Like, why would he be sitting in the disabled thing? And I was like, I would do that. I would totally do that. I was like, white people are like that. I wouldn't be like, oh, well, I'll leave it free so if a disabled person gets on, who maybe I can't see the disability, they'll see the seats free. I would sit in it until I saw an overtly disabled person. And I went, oh, fuck. I but am an entitled white person. So it was glitch in the matrix, though. How do they know that the person who they've judged <laughs> to not they, have a disability he doesn't say, have a disability? They, they said, he said, if a disabled person comes, I'll move. He didn't yeah. say, oh, actually, I am disabled. I've got, you know, this condition. And I listened to it and I went, this is, I think, how sometimes, when sometimes men write to me and go, oh, I felt this last week when I heard that. 
and they say you need to never be disparaging about men and you need to always include us and you need to change and I'm like well I'm not writing to two dope queens and going can you make the space more white for me <laughs> and never would and nor Maybe should you they should. I, I mean it just I'm like it's very I'm, offensive <laughs> just like no I'm not changing disability not. shaming our people <laughs> <laughs> this cannot stay in the edit <laughs> the irony may not be clear <laughs> please welcome to the stage Deborah Francis White <laughs> So, um, I find men kind of fascinating. I mean, you're a man, sir, aren't you? Is that your man? Yes. yes, you are. Could you explain what goes on? Why? Just explain why. What's going on there with the whole man thing? And listen, we're talking here about trends we've identified, usually with white, straight, cisgendered men. And we're not talking about all men all the time. So please don't feel personally excluded. Um, I've noticed some trends. You know, there's this sort of whole mansplaining thing. I have noticed some more trends among men. One is what I call mansploring. And mansploring goes like this. Shall we order some food? Should we get some food in? Oh, actually, I just went up to the bar and asked. They stopped serving at three o'clock. Oh, they don't normally here. Yeah, they, 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 did, they have today. They've, they've shut the kitchen. No, they've probably got chips and stuff. Let me just go and ask. That's mansploring. <laughs> but if I go and ask, things will be different because you've asked a stupid question. You've just not asked... You've, you've not listened to the answer properly with your little lady ears. So you probably haven't heard... What they probably said was, yeah, we've got chips and stuff, but we don't have the full meals. No, they said they've closed the kitchen. I asked explicitly what they had and they said only crisps. But he can't stop himself from going to find out because he thinks he's going to get a different answer. And okay, that's all very well when it's in a pub. But when it's in my fucking handbag. Uh, could I borrow a charger? Could I borrow a charger? I actually didn't bring one. Do you mind if I just look in your handbag? Because you might have and you might have forgotten that you brought one. Well, I haven't and I didn't. Yeah, but you might have. So if I look in your handbag, we'll know for sure. We already know for sure, but we already know for sure. No, but we don't know for sure because we haven't looked. Well, I've looked in my own handbag and there's no charger there. Yeah, but I think it'd be good if I looked because then we'd know for sure. And it's all very well when it's your handbag, but you know, like when you're in bed with a man and you're saying, um, honey, my clitoris is, is to the left. And he goes, I think I'll just keep exploring over here on the right. I'm pretty sure it's... I'm pretty sure it's down here. Once, my husband... I'd heard Rick Mail talking on the radio about how they'd tried to make the young ones into an American television programme. If you're young, the young ones... Yeah, 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 yeah. It's a, it's, it's a, TV, it's a TV show, it doesn't matter. And they tried to make it in America and hadn't worked, and they'd taken the character of Rick out. And I told my husband that, and he went, no. He, I said, what? I said, but it was Rick Mayall, it's his show. He was talking about He said, I'd know if that had happened. <laughs> I said, well, surely Rick Nail would know. And he went, no, he would have been joking. He's just telling a story for laughs. And I was like, no, it was Rick Mail. I got so angry. And he went, well, I'll have to look it up. And I was like, he had to mansplore it before it was true. That's one. That's mansploring. Okay. This one is called manshevling. Okay, so a friend of mine, she's working on a project at the moment. She's super experienced. And it's sort of just been kind of overseen by an older man who keeps telling her how to do it and taking it away from her. And I said, well, you just, just say, you know, like I've made all these really successful things. So, you know, I want to do it this way. And she said, the thing is, I think the reason they don't have any confidence, she said, I'm a bit disheveled, not very confident when I come in the room and I'm a bit disheveled and I look like I know what I'm doing. And I said, are you fucking serious? Have you seen 90% of the men in the arts? If a man in the arts comes in in an old ripped overcoat and like hair that hasn't been brushed for a week and he stares at the floor they go he's a genius give him an opera <laughs> genuinely that man will get to direct an opera and don't disturb him while he's working but he's not working he's just looking at the floor going Ugh. he's not 
start looking at the actors. He doesn't know anything about this. He doesn't do opera. Why have you given him one? Uh, he's a genius. He's at work. He's at work. He's a genius at work. It's true. That is true. That is man shoveling. And some of them aren't genuinely like that. They have put that shit on. They deliberately, I remember men at university doing it, they would sort of put on this persona of being a very important troubled theatre director. And they're now all fucking working in positions in the arts that are, are like terrifying. And you know, they've just basically gone, well, if I wear one trainer and then one leather shoe, people will think I was thinking about Cozy Van Tutti. That's, that's how they do it, I'm telling you. A friend of mine is working for a big tech company and the head of tech has become their CEO and they said, we're trying to get him to dress a bit better because he always looks like he slept rough. <laughs> that was fine when he was just behind the scenes doing tech, but now he's got to talk to clients and he's got to give speeches, he's got to talk to people. And we're just sort of guiding him. So there's a team around him trying to make him look like a CEO. And I said, if that were a woman, would she get a team of people? And she just laughed and went, that would never be a woman. A woman cannot become CEO without a basic understanding of oral hygiene. <laughs> She said, it's just not a thing. There is not one female CEO in the world who doesn't clip her toenails. It just isn't, it's not possible to get there. She was like, no, he wears shell suits. He wears track suits with his lunch down the front of them. She was like, a female CEO, if you want to be a CEO and you're a woman, my God, you've got to be together. Like, you don't have to be highly femme, but you have to be something. You have to have looked in the mirror, like, at least once a day. And then changed based on what you saw. And that's, that's, so that's man shoveling. And the last one, I'm calling man laxing, but I am open to better names. And this is about the way that often men seem so chillaxed. Actually, it's, this is really white man laxing. They seem so chillaxed about everything they do, like everything they do is good, and everything they've just done is good, and they're so happy to present it to you. And they just sort of do anything and then go, that was pretty ace, don't you think? <laughs> and I've sort of worked out why this is. I went to a, it was like a recruitment seminar. It was like TED for people who are in talent and recruiting. And uh, we were having a chat, I was having a chat in a bar with these two guys who have a consultancy, both American, one white guy and a black guy. And we were all chatting and I said, a lot of the times women who are in senior positions report that they feel they can't hire too many women in a row because then it's like they've got some kind of gender politics and they're sort of trying to smuggle women in. And now they've been given that C-suite or that senior partnership or whatever it is. And now it's like, aha, all along you were going to fill this place with women. And so they have this suspicion if they suggest a woman for promotion or they say, oh no, she's really good and they have to vouch for her and they think that everyone's going to think that it's because she's a woman and they're treating people unfairly and therefore they tend to favour men and you know, all of this complexity. And the black guy said, I have that. He said, if I've hired too many black people, I think, oh, I better hire somebody white because I think otherwise they're going to think I'm the black guy person who's just always hiring black guys and we both looked at the white guy and went do you ever feel like that <laughs> and he just laughed in our face and we went no but do you ever feel like that people are going to go oh, he's got a white guy agenda <laughs> hiring all those white guys always had another white guy one of his own oh oh and he laughed and he said i've literally never thought about it to this second he said i've hired so many white guys in a row and he said no it's the opposite if i have someone who isn't a straight white guy he said, I get myself a beer and take the rest of the day off. <laughs> That's white man laxing. Right there, my friends. Right there. No, he gives himself a little gold badge for diversity. That's a, has anyone got a better name for that? He laxing. He laxing. Oh, good. Thank you, Zoe Kim's Ma. That, my friend, is he laxing. So those are your big three. And if you could hashtag tweet, if you see anyone mansploring, manshevling, um, or he laxing then please tweet. Thank you very much. Uh, would you like to meet our very special guest? Um, she is a wonderful British comedian and she is currently performing here in Sydney. Please put your hands together and make excited noises for Tiff Stevenson. Oh, this is exciting. Right. I know. Oh, nice. Thank you for coming, Tiff. Do you have any insight on men? I was just having a conversation with my partner about this today because let me tell you, this last week has been a strain on all men. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, to be fair, he was just like, oh my God, I just hate men. <laughs> he was like, I'm beginning to feel like you, like spending the week going through Twitter, kind of 
And I say this as a father of daughters. Um, <laughs> I actually feel that that's almost progress in some way for once that men get to be defined by the people that surround them mm. <laughs> rather than just being their own individuals. Imagine what that must be like, ladies. Um, so, um, yeah, he was kind of going, what can I do to be better? And I just feel like it's just so awful and relentless. And I'm like, I just think all men need to be aware of how many women have experienced on some level the stuff that's sort of come to light. And not just in entertainment, but wow, that's a breeding ground for really... Really awful behaviour. Do you think it is any worse in entertainment? I think it's going on in... I mean, it I probably is a bit, everywhere. but it's, it's going on everywhere. But when it ha comes out in entertainment, we all hear about because people are famous. I think there are certain things about the entertainment industry that it's sort of... It's like a little more lax and it's very personality-based and mm. it's very like, take a laugh, have a good time. There's also a lot of alcohol and... In entertainment, you're dealing with much more intangible mm. qualities in what people are looking for in a job, in an audition situation, in a stand or even a writing, any kind of creative industries. In other jobs, there are set qualifications that say you have these, do you meet this criteria, then you could possibly get the job. Whereas in the world of acting, for example, they go, well, we want a leading lady, but you need to be a size 10 in a bikini. And I think just Jennifer Lawrence just came out today and went, oh, I had to do like a nude lineup. Oh, yeah. With other women to prove that I was right for this role. And then she was told to use the pictures of her as incentive to diet. And they said, because the other women were much thinner, and they said, you need to be as thin as they are. It sounds really awful and really, really humiliating. Do you ever think Ooh. I might have put the weight on because men fucking skeeve me out? That's oh. interesting, because I've been lots of sizes. I, yeah, and yeah. I've been all the sizes. And, I do. Uh, not all, not sorry. All I've, been, <laughs> I've been some of the sizes... Mm. I've been more sizes than most people have been, is what right. I'm trying to say. Yeah. Okay, it's not a competition. <laughs> <laughs> I don't it's like think... a Donald Trump thing. I've been all the sizes. I've been, I've been I'm great so at many being sizes. sizes. <laughs> I'm great at being sizes, uh, but I've been various different sizes, and I don't feel like I've ever had more or less attention at any size. Mm. I think. I say for me, like I've been a few different sizes as well. A few different have you been okay. as many sizes as I have? Maybe. I've been like, <laughs> I've been like a six and an eight and a ten. And I'm a 14 now. At some sort of level or some point in various times, I felt the protectiveness. I just felt protected more if I felt less. I, would, yeah. Less, less exposed somehow. Less exposed. Yeah, weirdly. Like, so and that's just a sort of psychological thing. It's sort of like you feel like you want a bit of something. I think we don't choose when we get the attention. It happens to us. And I always used to describe it as in a show a couple of years ago, I talked about that point that I think all women have in our teens. For some, it's like 13 years old or 12 years old. For some, it's around 14, 15. And it's almost like your piece of fruit that suddenly become ripe and needs to be plucked by a lusty old man. And it's never the guy that you would want to do it. Do you know what I mean? All of a sudden, <laughs> you get this attention and it's like you're in this world that you never wanted to be in. And it's not the boy that you might like talking to. It's suddenly you're now a sexual being to like just gross men. Mm. Like really, and it's really brutal. It's a really brutal way of entering into womanhood, I think. I also think it's quite interesting. I mean, my experience of that is quite... Taxi. Uh, <laughs> sorry, that wasn't me. That was the character that, that I Dave, used to play. Dave. Uh, <laughs> I think that the thing is... Uh, but seriously, guys. Um, I think the thing that, in my experience, that's been different is that it's not only is, like, the some male tension is unwanted and some mm. is desired because I don't actually have my own sexual desire for men, so it's all unwanted. Yeah. So, And I think for straight women, having to actually negotiate that, of learning, learning how to negotiate desire and actual relationships with men, but some men and not... Hashtag not all men. Uh, not all I think, it's, I think it's a really tricky sort of thing, especially for young women and especially when... It's in these sort of slippery type of situations where their jobs and their livelihoods and things are involved as well, that it becomes, it's quite tangled and I think it can be quite confusing. I remember thinking this like years ago and I could be wrong, but I've been proved right so many times on it. But I, like, it was about six or seven years ago, I came up with this phrase of like, turn a man down once holds a grudge for a lifetime. And I do feel that there is this kind of 
element of like attraction or sexuality that happens between men and women that there is this weird power dynamic i know i've definitely been punished like in an industry way in a work sense by having said no to men and turning men down and even if they're not aware of it or they don't acknowledge it at the time something will happen that then becomes who the fuck do you think you are mm. how dare you you turned me down well yeah which is interesting because i my experience of that i've certainly seen that happen to other people or to have to negotiate like a sort of sexual politic with men that they're working with whereas me it's like it's not you it's not i'm not making the decision i'm not doing anything to spite you or embarrassing you it's just i am it's like you know, I'm like a chair. I'm a lesbian. I'm not. We're both not attracted to you. <laughs> and I get it. Like lots of men will say now, like of the straighty whitey men type, like, oh, it's so difficult. Like you can't compliment a woman anymore. Of course you can. You can compliment any of us. You can say you look lovely. We might say thanks, but then we owe you nothing. It can't be any plainer. And that's the bit that hurts because for the guy, they've put it out there and there's a potential of being rejected. But tough shit, no one's stopping you paying a compliment. Of course you can. You just may not get the response you want. It's not like these guys are like, my favourite thing is just complimenting women and I'm really worried that's going to be taken away. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They're not like, I'm I'm just like you look do. beautiful, you look amazing. Oh, I'm getting such a rush from giving out these compliments. <laughs> <laughs> it's the expectation that it will be yeah. reciprocated. It's, it's the women for no personal gain. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. don't want, I don't, in fact, I don't enjoy it when there's any follow-up. I, it <laughs> robs me of that pure act of kindness. It is, it's, it's exactly that. It's the subtext that you're talking about. The compliment, the compliment is never just the compliment. Mm. The subtext is, let's take this further. Do yeah. you want to get on the end of my penis? Like, that's the subtext. <laughs> yeah. Years oh. ago, I had a show called How to Get Almost Anyone to Want to Sleep with You, and want to was key. Not to get anyone to sleep with you, but how to get them to want to sleep with you. Most of it was for women, but the bit I used to do at the end was to teach men to compliment women for no personal gain. You know, you might see someone, and I used to teach them to do it on the tube in London, that the way to do it is just as you're about to get off the tube, you go, by the way, I think you look amazing, or something like that, and then get off as the door's shut, and you just walk away, and I swear that woman will think about you on her deathbed. But she'll be like, where was it? He really understood me, and he didn't ask for anything, he didn't allow the, but I used to say, you have to get off. If you miss the door, then you're a creepy stranger who's given a compliment, shifted away, and is now staring at a door. I don't care if you fall under the train, you get off the train. I wouldn't do that bit anymore because, you know, the world has changed so significantly that I wouldn't teach any man to do that. But it was a lovely bit in its own way because it was saying you can compliment somebody and then not hang around and expect more and yeah. expect more and expect yeah. more. Because actually, I compliment people on the tube. I saw a woman not long ago and she just looked incredible and I bumped into her three times. I mean, I bumped into her. She didn't notice me. But I kept seeing her and I just thought she looked so beautiful and I just eventually just went... Your outfit is so hot. It's so great. And she went, oh, my God, thank you so much. I'm on my way to a job interview. And it was just a really lovely moment. So I think there are moments where we can tell each other. A woman cat called me from her car in, like, a cat really lovely... you? Yeah, when I was in L.A. She went, you look beautiful! Like, a nice dress. And I was like, thanks. Yeah. I will accept that But do you think that's what... Um, those guys yelling from utes have, have all seen your show. <laughs> They're like, well, I'm not on a train, but she won't see me again. Show us your tits! <laughs> <laughs> She's going to think about me on her deathbed. <laughs> I'm yeah. may, I may have done damage. It was a long time ago. If that's happened to you... That's you... a good point, though, actually. That's the valid well, point. Look. If your compliment is shouted from the top of a building <laughs> or out of a moving car, if, like, the Doppler effect applies... <laughs> That's probably moving into street harassment, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, it so is, it is. That's why we mustn't do that. But I did once, I was walking home and a man was just leaning in a doorway and I was walking back from the gym and I was all just in my sweat sort of thing. And he just looked me up and down and went, groovy chick. And I was like, yes, I am a groovy chick. <laughs> and I loved it. I absolutely loved it. But I'm not suggesting like in the 1960s. <laughs> <laughs> was he on his way to an Austin Powers party? <laughs> <laughs> I loved it. But he wasn't, there was nothing aggressive about it or there's no expectation with it. But you can't say to men, you can do it like that because they okay. won't do it like that. You know, like. <laughs> <laughs> but it is, it's, it is about attraction. I think I saw a tweet from like David Baddiel as well going, can we stop referencing Harvey Weinstein's looks and him being fat and ugly and make it about his crimes? And then someone went, fuck off, don't tell women how to feel. 
about, about a predator who's... I think you're allowed to feel that. I think you're allowed to feel grossed out and disgusting, whatever I, you're, you know... I'm slightly with David Baddiel on that one because the thing is, what makes Harvey Weinstein unattractive is nothing to do with his weight or his age or balding. I have fancied old, bald men so much. Some, there's just a smattering of women going, yes, I also fancy old, bald and fat But I do. I do. Yeah. I've, I've massively fancied fat men and older men than me and bald men. That's, all of those things are sexy if the person is looking he's at sexy, you and you're But maybe there's, that's their version what? of saying he's not sexy. Maybe they're saying that instead not, of... But he's, the reason he's not sexy is because he is misusing power in a really unpleasant way. Yeah, I think there's... Well, I mean, there's two things. Are you both... You're both right, girls. Um, <laughs> God, because it's like, obviously, yes, he can be sexually attractive to people as well. Like, it's not the way that you look doesn't define whether or not you can be attractive. And so, technically, that's wrong. But also, these women are kind of, like, angry and upset... And so that's the way well, that it's coming he, out. He, so he, it's, and it's sort of it's... And, I don't want women and men who have any of those qualities to feel mm. less sexy because people in the press are going, oh, I'm so disgusting. Because I think the women, though, he objectified them and made it about their physicality and the way they look. So I think they're within their rights to do it back and go... I find you repulsive for these reasons. I mean, the main reason he's repulsive is obviously his personality and his actions. But, I just think, you know, but that's like saying yeah, he sexually coming. harassed them so they can sexually harass other people. I just don't get it. I don't, that's yeah. not... I don't think how they feel about him, in whichever sense, is them harassing him. Although, I don't to think, be fair, no, like, no, uh, but some of saying, the women who are saying this are like European models who are not, as a group, known for their tact. About how other people look. Yeah. Are you model shaming? Yeah. <laughs> what do we? But, um, uh, what do you? What is it that you love about being with men? I know what I love about my partner. I know what I love about Paul. Uh, there's like a, almost like a serenity and a, a calmness to him that I have in no way, shape, or and that, that's not gender specific. But you know, like I don't know if I could, what what I love about men as a group. Because there's plenty of men that I don't like, but there's ones that I do like. And what they tend to have in common is they tend to like strong women. Uh, so, uh, but yeah, I mean, I think again, it's not about being male. It's just about him having a grounding and a a centre that I'm quite a flighty, flitty, you know, person who's always all over the place, always late. Because <laughs> who likes punctuality? Turns out everyone, you know, like. I, 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 but. I, I am a person that's, you know, I'm uh, sort of, yeah, he's got a... Sometimes a, I crave male company in general. Sometimes it's nice to be with men. There is a sort of, I think, I don't know, I don't, I'm not saying it's anything biological. I think it's probably they've been trained up by years of confidence building by society, telling them that they should be in all the influential rooms. But there is something nice sometimes about being with people who are so certain. Sometimes there's something enjoyable about being with very confident arrogant funny men for a short period of time am I, am I the only one you know they're sexy but even just yeah. as friends I've got male friends who I just go and I meet them for a pint and we have a really good conversation and there's something about a maleness sometimes did you ever get drawn in by maleness Zoe oh I like lots of men I just can't tell which ones they are <laughs> I don't know if there's anything that I don't get from female friends that I do from hanging out with a bunch of men bar the sexual attraction Oh, that's interesting. Well, it's all made up, isn't it? Like, I mean, people are just people, and some of them are good and others aren't. Like, <laughs> I think, in truth, my heart is with my female friends, that if I'm really in trouble or I really want to talk something over, I go to the women. But there's just times... I think it's a diversity thing. Right. And as a trend, certainly not an absolute, but as a trend, men have more testosterone. And I sometimes wonder if that kind of environment... If there's something about that, I was reading some awful statistic. It's something like 94% of all murders are done by men. So if men, and, no, no, it's 96%, and the 4% that are done by women are often in self defense. So if men stop killing, killing would stop. So there are differences. <laughs> there are differences. That's more than a trend. That's an absolute. I feel like this panel is like what men fear when uh, <laughs> they hear like feminist panel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we don't normally talk like this, but I don't know. I just felt like this week it was so... It, it, it Jeff was waving in... at me saying, you have to go. Oh, I do. Um, do you have one more thing to say? Uh, maybe I'll say one more thing. I haven't been very funny. Sorry. Uh, 
I, yeah, look, quick, that's my quick. Need. A man would never apologise for that, by the way. <laughs> Go. I'm just here because I'm smart. People care what I have to say. I did want to say something about the underreporting, which I feel is maybe important with, with this going on and the Me Too hashtag, which I saw had been, of course, hijacked by Katie Hopkins today, which I oh. saw that was so frustrating. It brought up a lot of stuff, and I have had probably 20, 30 incidences uh, in my career when stuff like this has happened. And I was reminded of one when I was 18 years old. A producer invited me to meet him about a TV show he wanted me to present. So I went along, this is the time we still had pages, and I took my pager, I met him at a cafe in Paddington, we had a coffee, and then he was like, well, you need to come back to mine to watch the pilot. And I was like, oh, I don't think I can, maybe another time. He was like, well, are you serious about, you can't audition for the job unless you know what it is. So then, of course, I go back to his house, and then he does have a pilot to show me. We watch this thing, and then he goes, I'm gonna have a sauna so we can carry on talking in there. What? <laughs> I mean, it sounds unbelievable, but bearing in mind, like, I'm now 40 years old and I'm saying it proudly, I identify as 30, but fine. Uh, like, <laughs> I, I, was, um, I was, like, I was 18 years old, so I was like, um, n- no, I don't really want to. And then he started laughing at me, making out that I was being vain or silly. And then he went away, got me a robe, and he went away. He came back with his robe on. I put the robe on and went into the sauna fully clothed. Oh, <laughs> with a robe over the top (laughs) and then sort of spent five minutes just continually trying to talk about the project to sort of deflect it until inevitably he asked me for a massage. I don't know what it is about robes and massage, but I think we might need to ban bath robes. Um, And then I managed to like talk my way out of it and go, oh, I have to go. And my parents literally ran out and then went to a payphone and, and called my dad. And I remember thinking about it, and when you hear it in its whole thing, if I went, I got in a sauna with a guy, they'd be like, well, what did you think was going to happen? But that's the problem with these sort of things. It's a person in power, and inch by inch, they gain your trust, Mm. and then they make you feel stupid, vain, ignorant, unprofessional if you don't comply. But it's very clever, it's very calculated, and entirely predatory. And I don't know any women that have sort of done it's a very specific male thing and i don't know whether it's because those are the sort of areas that they can work in and get away with it and know that the boundaries are blurred in entertainment so it was just really that to kind of say you know this is why it goes unreported because we feel like we're we being silly complicit? and yeah. we feel complicit and also we go oh well, i didn't report that because i was like well nothing actually happened yeah. but something did happen you know, a man tried to coerce me into having sex with him with the promise of a job. So, yeah, so that was what I wanted to say on that, I think. Thank you very much for sharing. Oh, and thanks. Big round of applause for Tiffany Stevenson! Thanks, guys. Does anyone have a question? Yes. Hello, what's your name? Hi, Tash. Where are you from? Sydney. Here. And what's your question? Um, with the Me Too hashtag that's been happening the last couple of days, and we've seen more posts from men coming forward saying, I have, and then listing all the terrible things that they have done in the past to women. Do I haven't seen that. Yeah, there's been a couple. Does someone and- just say, I have? <laughs> <laughs> hashtag Me Too. I haven't seen that. I have. Me Too. <laughs> Yes, sorry, continue. (laughs) So, basically, it feels like a a way for them to absolve their guilt for the things that they have done in the past, now that they're seeing that pretty much every woman that they know has been sexually assaulted or sexually harassed. Um, Do we feel like perhaps we need to keep the conversation uh, centred on the victim's voices, or do we need to centre it on the men doing the horrible things? Oh, um, <laughs> it's. I well, mean, whatever we say here will be the chosen, yeah, <laughs> path. It's a tricky one, isn't it? Because I sort of think official policy that will be taken yeah, up. Yeah, so, so we've got to answer this carefully. Don't say the wrong thing, Deb. Oh, um, I'll, I would say. Both. I think Oscar has to probably answer because he would know. <laughs> well, well actually, I mean, the thing is, men can't get it right, can they? I mean, if they don't own up. Then you go, oh, you didn't own up. And if they do own up, you go, oh, you're absolving your guilt. Like you're in a confessional booth. What can we do? Like, either we own up or we don't own up. Which one do you want? 
quick I think, I think some of the I have stuff has, has been in response to people saying like how about rather than just like women you know calling for that it's a little bit like the compliment thing it's like yes it's important for that to be said but I don't think that a reward should be expected so I think that's mm. so you think that yeah it, yeah yeah okay that's interesting I'm starting to see some men in my feed, and I only have lovely men in my feed, obviously. Um, but this is the whole point. We don't, you know. I've, heard, I've seen some men in my feed say, look, I'm sure I've made jokes and I've done things and I can think of things, but I, I really don't think, and I hope I have never made a woman feel scared or misused power. But even the fact that they're saying, God, I'm thinking of things that could have been misconstrued or I probably did go too far or when I was younger I did this or I must, really mustn't make sure I never do that again. That's great, because that's a sort of level of awareness that is happening. But yeah, it's a bit like white people acknowledging the marginalization of people of color. You can't expect a gold star for it, you yeah. know, like... It's the thing, it's like um, no cookies for allies. That's the mm. thing, it's like, I didn't make that up. I stole it from like black trans women, probably. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's... <laughs> they make everything up and then we still uh, but that is a thing it's like yeah you don't get cookies for being an ally it's like you should be because of that and I also think it's tricky where men are sort of saying like I have actually done something it's like well maybe you should go to jail I don't know like that's <laughs> the other thing it's like if you're just like, well Harvey's not going to go to jail Harvey's in a sex addiction spa yeah, it is a spa. It's like a sex addiction clinic, but it's in Switzerland. Come on. It's, sex addiction. It's really. definitely going to be... The trouble is at a sex addiction spa, I imagine... They're all sex addicts. Well, that would be the trickiest place not to have sex. Especially if it's a spa. What do you wear at a spa? Bathrobes. Yeah. <laughs> That's the only thing. I don't know the answer to the question, except that I think that I've seen lots of men... At Taxi. Taxi. <laughs> um, I've seen lots of men allying up and saying, oh shit, I didn't realise it was this vast. And I think they're a bit shocked by how many women are saying it. Mm. And I think they're a bit shocked by the numbers of it and the gravity of it. And I think it is going to shift something. Awareness is only ever a step to progress. It's not about going like, whose voices should we be focusing on? Well, we should be focusing on all of them because they're all part of the world, but we should actually be moving towards progress. Focusing on either of those things is heading towards, hopefully, less sort of sexual harassment and sexual assault of women. Any path that leads to more of that, don't take that path. Let's not take that one. <laughs> it's a Good bad, point. bad path. Good point. Just as long as we're all straight on Good. that. No. That's the kind of thing Oscar would say. Yeah. Yeah, we want more. I think that the, what I've read, from what I've read, women want less, not more. I don't know if I've really read that right. But <laughs> reading between the lines, I think they want to be sexually harassed less. That's what. And listen, if that's what they want, give the little ladies what they want. That's what I say. I love to see a smile on their little faces. Nag, so nag, lovely nag. when they smile, you know. And I've discovered if you sexually harass women, they don't smile as much. And I love. <laughs> listen. He's horrible. He should not be allowed <laughs> out. Um, so sorry about him. And all I can do is apologise. Is this what you've been living with, with this man? Yeah, it's great. Yeah, it's, gr it's great, but also it makes me feel a bit like, ooh. Did you ever feel you have to take him off at night? Uh, I do. He's not allowed in the house. Uh... <laughs> do you ever do him in the house for your girlfriend, though? I ever... used to, when I was first... She doesn't like it. Um, but when I... <laughs> when I was first... Two things. One, when I was first doing Dave... Now I can just sort of switch it on, but when I was discovering the character, uh, I would sort of do it around the house and I would just sort of harass her. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I'd feel like, hey, and I'd just go up and, like, hump her while she was working, just, like... <laughs> on her laptop like stop it and then uh, the other thing is also people always want to know does Dave come home and people always ask my girlfriend if she's had sex with Dave oh come on the answer of course is no. Uh, no she's like no two reasons one I'm a lesbian two Dave is not real <laughs> but Don Draper's not real and I might still have sex with him someday <laughs> that could happen uh, do we have any other questions? Yes, one in the front row. Hello, what's your name? Hello, I'm Laura. Hi, Laura. Uh, back to the Weinstein saga. Sorry mm. to bring it back to that. But um, 
You guys mentioned earlier on in the talk about how it's almost a surprise when it's in the entertainment industry and it's kind of hard to reconcile that aspect of the story. And I was thinking that it's possibly because we do view especially Hollywood elites as quite left and quite liberal and open and intelligent and blah, 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 and kind of above barbaric behaviour or whatever it is, sexual assault. And then, of course, when we hear these stories about it and how normalised it is, it kind of reinforces this idea that there are bad people in left spaces. And mm. I, my question to you guys is, if you're in a space that you think is safe, or you think you are amongst people who understand where you're coming from and someone says something or does something that's not on, it's much harder almost to kind of address that because, mm. no, 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 like I'm a member of this society or I'm part right, of right, this right. and I identify with what you're talking about and I'm not a bad person, they're the enemies, I'm fighting the good fight. So how can we kind of not necessarily kit and glove our way into like having our opinions heard but make sure that we are addressing problematic behaviour within safe spaces and within kind of the, those societies or those aspects of society that mm. are Well, first of all, I would never call a room with Harvey Weinstein in it a safe space. <laughs> no. <laughs> and lots and lots of, lots of those spaces are really, really not safe. And so just because someone says they're liberal or a space is clearly, like in America, a Democrat space over a Republican space, my answer to that would be use their values to demonstrate that what they're doing, ask them questions throw questions back at them because if they are liberal and they do believe in equality and they do believe that power should not be misused then that's a mirror if you're dealing with someone who doesn't believe that who thinks take what you can and smash and grab and run then it's a much harder argument so I would say ask lots of questions and use their politics to show them that their values and their actions are not matching yeah and I think that that's a really interesting conundrum I think it's really it's actually really common and I think a thing that you see quite often now is like ironic sexism to myself um <laughs> no they're like who will use like guys who use kind of like humory ironic -y type of ways because those sorts of behaviors are insidious and they do find the sort of like cracks and the ways to get away with things i think it's about trusting yourself because the way that those guys that sort of like oh, i'm a good guy i've got these reasons why the only way that works is if it, it actually makes you doubt yourself and therefore like allows it to continue happening and that for them to get away with it and if i think if we sort of doubt ourselves less about questioning someone else's behavior then that does actually cut that off and it's about making people sort of accountable for that and going like yeah nah yeah no you're being funny but it's still not cool oh thanks guys thanks <laughs> So we have a charity this week. Who is collecting for their charity? So we're collecting for Red Kite tonight. So Red Kite is a children's cancer charity. So we support children between um, the age of zero and 24 um, and their families when they're going through cancer. And um, it's a really, really important cause. For one of the reasons is because um, in, in a family where a child has cancer quite often, a parent, more often than not, the mum has to give up work in order to be on the oncology ward making decisions for their child every day whilst they're making different treatment um, decisions and progressing through that. So we, it puts a lot of financial hardship upon the family um, and we provide a lot of financial assistance to Great. support and that. If, where can we give online if people aren't here tonight? At redkite.org.au redkite.org.au So if you're at home or you didn't really change tonight or any notes tonight, then please give there. And if you did, and no pressure, of course, uh, you've paid for your ticket, but if you have some money that you could put in for Red Kite, they would really appreciate it. Thank you so much, and brilliant work with that charity as well. Really lovely. Thank you. Um, Follow The Guilty Feminist on Twitter at guiltfempod. Check out our Instagram, instagram.com slash theguiltyfeminist. Like our Facebook page, sign up to our mailing list to get notified as soon as a new episode is released. And please go to iTunes and rate, review and subscribe. It helps other people find the podcast. It really does. And Idiots. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's hard to know whether they can't just Google. I'm at Deborah FW, if you would like to follow me. And I would also love you to listen to Global Pillage at globalpillage.net, which is a diversity-based comedy panel show. And I'm at Zoe Coombs Ma. <laughs> <laughs> you are. Do you have anything to plug? Anything coming up? Any shows or anything? No. 
things are going very badly. Just the real desert. Now I'll be doing no, not yet, but I, I will be doing more stand up. I'll be doing a new stand up show next year as myself. So Ooh. Dave stays in the kitchen. Yeah, so it better be good because if it's bad, then I've just proven the point. <laughs> It's just like, oh, women aren't funny. It will be. Stamp. Um. <laughs> you have been listening to The Guilty Feminist with me, Deborah Francis White, guest co host Zoe Kubsma, and our very special guest, Tim Stevenson. The producer was Tom Selinski for the Spontaneity Shop, and Jeff Ring at Australia Poverty Management. Our sound engineer was Christian Gibson. Thank you to everyone at Giant Dwarf, as well as all of you for listening. More information about this and other episodes, visit guiltyfeminist.com. Thank you, Giant Dwarf. You've been brilliant. Good night. I could do never I marry you, Kev, because you're a bad Do I have a, a friend in the audience tonight who was... Who, it, it, I think she might have come tonight. Do I have a friend who came who uh, used to be a Jehovah's Witness with me? Amelia, are you in? No, she wasn't coming tomorrow. Oh, I just thought she was in. She could I corroborate was, this. She did knock, but none of us answered, so... <laughs> <laughs> Maybe she's still at the door.